Hello, my name is Julian Brown, and I'll be explaining how I, at 18 years old, have created a microwave pyrolysis reactor, a device that turns plastic waste into fuel. First, I'll start with my drive. What motivates a teenager to build a reactor? Well, it all started back in 2021, early 2021, and I was very upset after I read an article that said globally, we throw away over 3.4 billion masks every single day, and in 2020 alone, 1.6 billion masks were thrown into the ocean. Now masks, they're made of plastic, just like many things in this world. And unfortunately, whether they're in landfills or in the ocean, they'll be around for a very long time. Now, for a while I was so disappointed reading these statistics that I became pessimistic, believing we're doomed and we're all gonna tr drown in our trash like Wally or something. However, Mom always taught me, if there's a problem, there's a solution. And I listened to that song by Michael Jackson, the one that goes, Man in the Mirror, and I decided, I'm making the change. Through observing nature and her complex systems, I learned there's no such thing as a material that cannot be recycled into nature's infinite closed loop. It all comes from and can be returned to Earth. It's just a matter of doing it properly. So, I know at this point, you're, you're probably like, what in the world is this bloke on about? I pay for recycling services, they work just fine, isn't that enough? Well, the truth is that I'm glad you asked because the mechanical recycling industry of plastics, well, it only partly solves the problem. Now mind you, I do commend anybody who pays for recycling services, support the movement, and I support you. However, the statistics are less than 9% of plastics created have ever been recycled. And there are several types of commonly used plastics that we can't recycle currently. And on top of that, most of the time, only clean and pure plastics are being recycled. So that basically means that most of the recycled plastic is pre-consumer level plastic, which defeats the whole point of recycling if you ask me. Well, okay, we can't recycle everything, how about we just throw it in a volcano? Let's bloody burn it all, right? Well, that's true. A fire is a good idea. Incineration plants work well because a fire does not discriminate between clean and dirty plastics. However, incinerators, they're potentially polluting, they're energy inefficient, and they're only available at industrial scales. That's why they're not the solution that we use right now. You see, my goal was to create a device that processes any type of plastic and anybody can use, including you. As an individual, as a community, or even as a small or large business, you can become a part of the solution to help the Earth. This led me to find the process of pyrolysis. In Greek, the word pyro means heat, and lysis means to break apart. Put two and two together and you get breaking apart something with heat. Now, unlike combustion and incinerators, pyrolysis does not involve oxygen. Compared to a fire where the plastic is oxidized and releases toxic chemicals- I know, I just said oxidized, I'm taking you back to chemistry tra class, trust me, it'll get better, hang in with me there, alright? Now listen, pyrolysis, it melts the plastic into a liquid, and then it evaporates it. I like to think of it like if you leave ice out on a, a hot summer day, what's gonna happen? It's gonna evaporate. So after that, we're gonna go back to the science. You take oxygen out of the equation, and it changes a lot. For example, in a fire, you'll get things like sulfur dioxide forming, which is when sulfur mixes with oxygen. And as we all know, you take one whiff of that stuff, you're a dead man, right? Well, maybe not that extreme, but at the very least, it's going to cause acid rain. Who wants that? I don't want acid in my rain. On the other hand, with pyrolysis, you would just get sulfur, which is a valuable element used in the industry. Now, since plastic is a product of crude oil, which is the same stuff we run our world off of, it is very energy dense. And under pyrolysis, this can be refined back into crude oil and liquid fuels. So instead of getting smoke, you get a combustible gas made of things like propane, hydrogen, methane, and butane, similar to natural gas. Another property of this pyrolysis gas is that there are condensable components in it. Now what does that mean? Well, have you ever in your life been walking outside cloudy day and you just get hit in the head with, you know, sky water, right? Pretty much rain, snow, so it's sky water. Well, that's condensation for you. When you take a gas, you turn it back into a liquid. You see, with pyrolysis, when it's condensed, it becomes an oil. So you get a face full of oil instead. 
Now, with that oil, it can be refined into crude oil, which can then be turned to liquid oils, right? Now, we talked about the, the solids. Uh, well, actually, not the solids. We talked about the gas and the liquids. Now, we're missing a part of this triangle. And I ain't talking the Illuminati. I'm talking about the solid products. Now, with the solid products, you get carbon black, which can be used for roads, pigments, tires, filters, and so on. And on top of that, it gets even better than that. For just $9.99.99, you can recover any minerals from the plastic. This includes copper, aluminum, silver, palladium, and guess what? You can get gold from plastics. That's pretty cool if you ask me. E-waste will give you gold. So all of these things combined together open up a large profit margin for plastic pyrolysis. People will get paid to bring their plastic waste into pyrolysis facilities, which by nature, they'll clean up litter, they'll reduce waste, and they'll beneficially change the way we as society view use plastics. With all this being said, how did I build a pyrolysis reactor? Well, I'll start with the basics. In order to break down plastics, high temperatures are required. Usually, the conventional reactor will reach these high temperatures through a propane flame, right? However, let's think about it. This method of heating is super inefficient, all right? Look, the heat has to go from the flame to the outside of the reactor, from the outside of the reactor to the inside of the reactor, and then from the inside of the reactor into the plastics, which are also an insulator. So that just wastes absolute mad amount of thermal energy that otherwise could have been used to, you know, break down the plastic. Here's a picture of my first ever reactor that ran off of propane. If I'm being honest, it was more of a fire hazard than a dang reactor. And because of its very uneven and inefficient heating, it would take up to 8 hours per batch of plastic. Which one of you wants to wait up to 8 hours to make sure you don't catch your whole backyard on fire? Certainly not I. And on top of that, I couldn't paint the thing because any type of paint would basically degrade under Satan's breath shooting under the reactor, so it was rusted and it, it just was permanently looking like a, an Autobot after fighting a bloody Decepticon. Not good. And that motivated me to find a better, more sustainable method of heating. Microwaves, yeah. Now microwaves use a fancy type of heating called volumetric heating. Lavish. Heating from the inside out, like that Disney movie. Now this greatly boosts the efficiency because instead of thick metal walls needing to be heated before the plastic is heated, it's the other way around. Other than efficiency alone, microwaves also greatly improve the, uh, the convenience and the profitability. And this is because since microwaves run off of electricity, we can hook it up to renewable sources like solar or wind, and that will allow it to have a profit of energy output in the end. So with this, I took a couple months of research to understand how microwaves work, how the electrical components work, and how not to barbecue myself like a 4th of July hot dog while messing with the stuff. Now I went on a quest to essentially build an airtight microwave reactor from scratch. Savvy. My very first attempt at this, well it was suboptimal at best. It did work, but there were tons of technical issues I had to work out along the way. One of the biggest issues was that I made it like a square. Here's a picture of it. As you can see, it's, you know, like a square reactor, because think about it. When was the last time you seen a circular microwave, folks? They don't make them like that. We're not that advanced yet. They're all square, so I was like, I'll make the microwave reactor square. Another thing is, you know, microwaves, they use a volumetric lavish heating, which is from the inside out, so the insulation goes on the inside as well. And these white aluminum fire bricks are perfect insulators because they don't absorb microwaves. So I designed the reactor to fit their 90 degreeness, and that came back to haunt me because the square design made the reactor really tough to get airtight. The corners would always have leaks of oxygen entering and pyrolysis gas leaving. Absolutely unacceptable! So I had to build a new reactor. With this new reactor, it by far was the most complex of them all, and it was pretty much a combination of my first and my second being circular but also having microwaves. So the process of building this one. Well, first I had to find a, a pipe large enough that could fit everything in it. I had to clean the pipe, had to cut it out. Then I had to cut out a lid and flanges with a plasma torch. And after I cut out the lid and the, the flanges, I had to weld them all together. I also had to design a waveguide, which is pretty much like a barrel for microwaves to travel. You know, microwaves are radiation. After all that was put together, I had to, um, I had to clean it all and I had to paint it with a high temperature corrosion resistant paint so it didn't look like a, a Decepticon as well. 
the alumina bricks, we custom cut them with a table saw to fit the circular design, and then they were sealed with a layer of Type S motor. That reminds me, microwaves are safe radiation because they are non-ionizing. I also had to design and built an electronics box for this reactor, so that way the high voltage transformers and wires were safely contained, you know, we don't want Optimus Prime running around here. So this is as far as I've come with this reactor, and in terms of functionality, the thing works bloody amazing. Here's a demo video of me demonstrating the gases being produced and how they're highly flammable. As well as a video of me showing the end byproducts. As you can see, it ain't ashes. It ain't nothing but pure carbon and minerals, baby. My next goal is to design a condensing system. So that way I can condense out any oils. And I also want to just get a scrubbing system so I can clean out the gas. Now long term, I do want to run it off of renewable sources. So that way it'll be carbon neutral as well as profitable. Now that brings me to my next point, carbon neutrality. As I wrap all this up, let me put my horns on and play my own devil's advocate, right? Answer some of the critical questions you probably are thinking. The challenges posed against pyrolysis. Now some argue that plastic pyrolysis is not a green process because doing so creates a lot of carbon emissions. And this is true. But my rebuttal is that in order to mechanically recycle plastics, we're creating just as much, if not more, carbon emissions. Let's go through the process. First, a truck must collect the plastic to recycle. After that, that truck must take that plastic to a facility where it's sorted and stored by machines. That makes emissions. Afterwards, the sorted plastic must be sent overseas to be recycled in a different country usually. That makes emissions. Any plastic that is not viable for recycling is either thrown out or burned in an open pit. That makes emissions and pollution. After that, the third world country will recycle the plastic with machines. This process also heavily pollutes water with microplastics that end up in the ocean, and this also makes emissions. And after all of that, the recycled plastic must be packaged, sent back to America, and flown or driven to a store to be sold all of which creates mass emissions. It's not rocket science. Clearly, pyrolysis has less steps, therefore it's less transportation and less emissions. Simple. Some also will worry about potential toxic byproducts. After all, things like BPA, they're toxic on their own inside of plastic. Imagine if they're heated up and aerosolized flying all over the place like Batman. Well, fortunately, since pyrolysis is such a closed and controlled system, scrubbers and filters can be used to catch any toxic products. And chemical processes and fancy things can convert these toxic products into valuable products. And on top of that, we can go even more fancy and use catalysts such as activated carbon, zeolite, or bentonite that can prevent many of the toxins from forming in the first place. So, last but not least, Many would detest pyrolysis, stating it's unprofitable. And this is because the law of thermodynamics states we cannot get more energy out than we put in. And this is very true. The energy input will always be higher than the output in pyrolysis. However, with plastics being very energy dense and yielding many types of valuable products, there's potential for profitability. And I hypothesize that when we run this off of renewable energy, it is absolutely possible for microwave pyrolysis to be economically viable. And even if all of this was untrue, microwave pyrolysis is still one of the safest and quickest solutions we have so far at eliminating plastic waste that otherwise is untreatable, unrecyclable, or bound to end up on our oceans or our landfills. As we become more innovative, energy efficient, and effective, I believe that microwave pyrolysis is one of the most exciting and promising options of the future. Not just for you, not just for me, but for we. Because we can become a part of the solution together. Thank you.